I'm about to interview someone who has inspired many, many women and girls in science. Her name is Noni de la Peña and I'm super excited to be with her here today. I hope you are too. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Maya Cavey and it's an honor to be here today, celebrating the International Day of Women and Girls in Science with Noni de la Peña, the godmother of virtual reality. Hi Noni. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. It's really lovely to meet you and I feel super honored that you want to speak with me this morning. Thank you. So when did you first start get in, getting involved with technology and why? So to be honest, um, my, uh, one of my father's very good friends helped start the computer science department at UCLA where my father also taught as an artist. And um, I remember just beelining for his computers, but he would often pull me out of the seat and put in my brother, right? <laughs> uh, uh, that used to happen, believe me, and um, uh, which was, you know, needless to say, frustrating for me. And then when I went off to college, I grew up in Venice, California. I went to Venice High School, um, and I was really not prepared uh, for showing up at Harvard. So I was, I got there when I was 17, and I'd never been on the East Coast in my life from the first day I started school. But they had this basic programming course that all the freshmen had to learn. And I was really good at it. And I was teaching all of my friends. But because I felt so unprepared academically, I didn't pursue it. And it took a long time for me to return to it. And actually, um, uh, but in the 1990s, I began to get back into the computers. And I taught myself HTML when the first websites came out. And then I read the book by Howard Rheingold about virtual reality, and I knew. I knew then, I read that book, and I knew that that was my path. And it was just, how do I get the techn technical skills to match with my desire? Okay. Um, can you tell us why exactly you're called the godmother of VR? <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's a funny story. So my... Um, I was at Sundance uh, Film Festival, and I, I'd already uh, had the first, very first VR piece uh, ever at the festival, right? I, I, they'd nobody had shown virtual reality there previous to me. And I think I probably had the first uh, virtual reality narrative uh, nonfiction uh, made at that point. People say I did. Um, that's what I called it, immersive journalism. But anyway, so I was in, I was in my area where my, my piece was installed, and a reporter came by from Engadget, and while he was there, People kept passing through and they would say, oh, yeah, Nani started me on virtual reality. Oh, Nani introduced me to virtual reality. Oh, you know, Nani made the, you know, these headsets with, you know, in the lab before we even had the Oculus Rift. Um, or we actually made the headsets in my garage at my mom's house uh, that we used uh, before there was good walk around Oculus Rift goggles. And um, uh, the reporter turned and looked at me and was like, you're like the godmother of VR. And then when he published that, The Guardian picked it up, and then it just spread like wildfire. And, um, every, you know, uh, these days, sometimes I feel like the grandmother of VR instead of the godmother of VR, but because um, I've been doing this such a long time now. But, um, but, I, but, I, but I do respect that um, I've been able to help a lot of people start their careers. That was, that's been a real honor for me. Yeah, that's amazing. And so um, did you have any challenges working in the realm of technology or VR as a woman? I remember when I, this is when you, you kind of notice these things. I, I, I remember when some new equipment was coming into the lab at, UC, at USC. And I was working with this one uh, uh, guy named Vangelis Limperidis. And I remember all the guys would cram in and they would just block me out. And I remember Vangelis turning around and saying, Nani, come check this out. And I remember this feeling of like, wow, a guy's inviting me in. This has never happened before. And the men would say that to each other, but it was the first time a man had turned to me and done that. And like, when I went into the, one of the programming courses at, at USC in the engineering department, there were 32 guys there and I was the only woman. And um, wow. uh, that's a difficult scenario no matter what. You, you definitely get this pit in your stomach that's even very difficult to define. Um, but, um, you know, we still need more women uh, being trained in these fields, but, but, uh, but I'm excited that, uh, we are starting to see uh, more young women um, thinking about technology and humanity together. Yeah. Uh, you know, right? And I think that's an important difference. 
Yeah, and that brings me right into my next question, which is, how has that changed uh, since you started? So, um, you know, I, I think even even now when we talk about climate change and and um, other issues, um, sometimes part of the problem is the messaging. We're not people aren't understanding what's going on, and it's mm-hmm. really because scientists aren't working with enough humanities people, right? We really need to combine the two things and think of the way that they actually intersect and how they can help each other. And I think, um, you know, I'm going to be a little bit biased, but I think that, you know, uh, there's a lot of young women who are attracted to the idea of helping. And um, the fact that there are these positive aspects of technology that aren't necessarily all just about engineering tasks um, means that this can become a really exciting field where we can create that intersectionality. So what exactly would you would you recommend to girls and women that want to get involved with science, technology, engineering, or math? So don't forget the arts so yes. for this. Because <laughs> um, they, they, they work together very nicely. But the main mm-hmm. thing is, you know, we need you. We need women in this field. They bring unique, different perspectives. They're going to make these fields stronger and better. And even when sometimes you get said you know, told weird things, weird things are said to you. I've faced that on multiple occasions. Um, you know, stay in the game because we really need you. Um, uh-huh. uh, I once had somebody say to me, you know, and I still haven't decided, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Somebody told me what a male founder of a big company that raised millions of dollars said, to, said that Nani de la Pena, she's tenacious. And... Uh, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, I'll just have to take it and, and encourage women to be tenacious too. Yeah, and I know that there are many girls like me who love the STEM subjects. And just thank you so much for helping us see that there's no limit to what we can accomplish. Thank you. You know, thank you for, for saying that. I'm, I'm glad I'm able to be in a position where, um, where it can inspire other young women to take this uh, path. Um, there is no mm-hmm. limit. Um, um, there are some times when it takes longer than you wish it would. Um, I just had a wonderful project funded and I started pitching it six years ago. So um, even in my position where I have a lot of um, respect in this field, it took six years for me to, to convince people to do this project. Mm-hmm. So, um, but it happened. So in the face of that, um, remember that you can accomplish anything, but sometimes you do, you do have to be conscious. That was amazing and inspiring. And I mean, I'm ready to go change the world. What about you? Have an amazing international day of women and girls in science. Bye.